All right, this is uh, opening of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Uh, date is August 25th, 2021. Starting off here. And hold on one second. I think it's initially comments for me, uh, which I have none. Uh, yeah, comments for me, none. Uh, mention on the playground, that is nice. I, uh, I think I said the last meeting, but I did get down to uh, a jump bridge area parking lot, and that looks great as well. That's about all I have to say. Dave, do you have anything for us? Now? Sure, just a couple of comments uh, or updates for the commission, Leroy. Thank you. Um, and I know Erin will have some other photos, I think, later in her report. But um, just jumping around town a little bit, we are wrapping things up at Puffer's Pond, although it is that was 90 degrees out there today. Um, we're wrapping things up in terms of water quality testing. Um, we're going to take our water quality testing through next week. And then we'll kind of wrap that up for the season. You may recall we've been doing weekly water testing. Um, unfortunately, given all the rain we've had, water quality in both Puffer Spawn and Fort River is not good right now after the weekend storm, the, the uh, remnants of, or I guess, yeah, the remnants of Henri. Um, you know, overall, I think we've got a lot of work to do on kind of getting more data uh, and really kind of digging in to see what's going on with water quality in the in the upper Mill River and the Fort River. I know we've got quite a bit of testing going on in the Fort River watershed this summer, and we'll we'll be able to take a look at that that those data sets this this winter. Um, Puffer Spawn is a little bit different um, animal, and you know every every watershed is different, so um, we're going to have to kind of get to the bottom of it. One of the interesting things is that. Um, when I first started here, we we did all the the water quality testing in the in Puffer's Pond, and it wasn't until 2018 that we really started to have problems with water quality and in fecal coliform in um, in um, in um, in uh, Puffer so and the Mill River so and E. coli so um, so anyway um, more more to come on that. Um, Leroy mentioned uh, new trailhead parking. We we uh, permitted both the parking at Wentworth Farm Conservation Area off of Stanley Street and then Sweet Alice parking and improvements. Here's a nice photo image of, of the new uh, 10 car parking lot at, um, at Wentworth Farm on the Stanley Street side. And uh, Rob Mora, our building commissioner and Brad Borderweek and his crew did a really nice job there. Some of the erosion control, of course, still in place, but we you know, repositioned rocks um, new parking for uh, those with disabilities, a nice new kiosk that we have to populate, um, but it's safe, it's orderly, and um, we hope it makes sense to people and, and people are already using it. Um, go back one if you could, Aaron. This is an image of the new parking area. This is uh, off of Bay Road. I believe it's 14 spaces uh, with, I think, two handicapped spaces, a new kiosk, split rail fence. We're not quite done on the west side, which is the right-hand side in this image. Uh, we're gonna be adding an, uh, uh, another row of um, split rail fence. But so for right now, it's kind of, it's kind of firming up. Um, it, it looks nice. We're gonna again, populate the, um, the kiosk there, but um, CPA dollars were used to pay for both of these projects. So. Pretty excited about those, and this will really complement all the work that we're doing on the um, the trail around the pond uh, in in collaboration with Kestrel Trust. I believe while I was on vacation, the NOI came to you. Here's another image looking west at the um, the drainage swale uh, that captures any of the runoff from that parking lot. But again, there's no hardback. There's no virtually no pavement. The only thing that was paved was the lip of the uh, uh, leading out to the front of uh, Bay Road there, but there'll be a, a new trail going to the west and then a connection to the existing trail going up the range to the south. So pretty excited about that. I think it'll really support some of the work we're doing there with Kestrel collaboratively. Um, other updates, summer staff. Um, we had three summer staff this year. 
uh, high school students and college students. Um, they did a nice job. They wrapped up last week. Um, we also had the, um, we had some uh, help from the town's ambassadors. Uh, these were folks that were primarily about uh, educating folks about uh, the pandemic and COVID-19. They were up at Puffer Spawn and they helped out there uh, with some messaging. So that was good. But right now we, uh, for the rest of the season, we are, we are back to our, our core crew of Brad and Brendan. So we're gonna have to be realistic about what we can do. do. Uh, right now, we're we're going to get going on some uh, some brush hogging on various conservation areas. Uh, we have a list of those conservation areas where, in particular, we know there are box turtles or wood turtles, and we try to leave those areas until very last in the season, hopefully until after the last frost. So sometimes we're actually brush hogging uh, well into November. Um, so we'll be hitting places like Mount Pollux and some of those well-used places, um, Puffer Spawn North, et cetera, doing some brush hogging. And then we're, we're not done with projects. We may still be coming to you with some additional permitting for projects. So, and then lastly, just a quick update on Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Uh, we are still moving along even at a snail's pace with that acquisition, but I'm told by our lawyers that we're talking about a late September, early October closing for uh, purchasing Hickory Ridge. Uh, there's a lot of work to do on that this winter. Uh, remember that it is not all conservation land. Uh, some of that land will be used for other purposes. So part of what I'll be coming to you with in the weeks and months ahead will be uh, kind of a, a draft plan for what parts of that uh, property will be conserved permanently, where the trails will be, and then what parts of the property, for instance, the frontage where the clubhouse will not be under a conservation restriction um, as, as one example, uh, because keep in mind that there was some CPA dollars that went toward that acquisition and then some general fund uh, money as well. So uh, some of the land uh, will not go into um, conservation and um, what happens with that will be determined by um, uh, kind of a master planning process that you all will be involved with and many other committees and boards, and of course, um, residents of Amherst. So um, more on that as we go. Did and you I'm get the, um, uh, is this, how this the contaminated soil process go? Yeah, that has um, for the most part wrapped up. Um, Aaron has been involved in the, the latter, you know, um, certainly it all went through you and permitting, but um, we're feeling very confident that the 21E um, uh, area associated with some of the outbuildings that housed uh, lawn mowers and, and equipment for the for the golf course, uh, we we feel pretty pretty good, uh, and I think DEP does about that cleanup. So um, we would not close on the property unless unless that was cleaned up. So that should be wrapped up. If it's not done now, it should be wrapped up any any day now. So. So happy to take any questions if you have them. And, you know, I, that was just kind of a, a, a little sm smattering. All good news and pretty quick for soil remediation in my experience. Uh, I had just a little question. I have not been over to the New Bay Road site, but it looks like the same kiosk for Stanley Street. Is that going to be the standard one that we see popping up from now on? Yeah, you raise a good question, Leroy. Um, um, the answer is, I think it'll be the standard but we're going to add something to it. We ordered those back uh, when um, we were we we had uh, more flexibility with CARES Act money, and um, the bottom line is we didn't order any of the cabinets that go on the outside that you can put material in, maps, and and other outreach material, and it stays. Uh, um, you know, uh, it keeps it safe from, for the most part, from, from the weather. So we're actually going to be adding those to the kiosks. So that will become kind of our standard kiosk because the ones you see out there are pretty basic. It's got a nice roof. Uh, it's nice kind of post and beam, uh, post and beam uh, style. But then where you actually post information and materials is really pretty basic. And there's not a lot of room to do it. And I don't think it'll protect it from the elements. So we just put in another order for uh, a couple of the cabinets to add to them. 
So then that should, uh, if all goes well, we'll get them from the same company and that will become kind of our standard trailhead kiosk where we put them up. Nice, happy to hear it. Uh, next up, Erin, uh, what do you have for us? Um, well, I sent the minutes kind of late. Um, I just finished them up early this morning. Um, so I don't know if everybody had a chance to read them, but they're, I've got them pretty bare bones <laughs> at this point. Like, so, uh, I don't know if folks want to take a look at those, um, or address approving them. I was uh, able to read them. them. Has everybody else had some time? All right. And I'm happy to make a motion if that's appropriate. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of August 11th, 2021. Second. All right. Voice vote. Uh, Fletcher? Aye. Larry? 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 Aye. I had to unmute un myself. Uh, Michelle? Aye. And Anna? Aye. Is that everybody tonight? Yep. Yeah. And I right. thank you guys. Um, <clears throat> so lots going on, but um, we don't have a ton in the way of um, approvals as far as other business is concerned. Um, one item I wanted to, well, there, there's a lot of projects underway right now, a lot of active construction going on. Um, one project I wanted to update you on is the Fairingbrook floodplain restoration project that's happening um, on the Fairing, the confluence of the Fairing and um, the Fort River. This is a town project, a grant that um, Beth Wilson received for um, floodplain restoration along the Fairing Brook. And um, I wanted to share some photos. It's um, so uh, that what you see is basically clearing up to the edge of Faring Brook at this point um, with erosion controls um, installed and uh, they are there have been a couple, a couple hiccups, I guess, with this one in the sense of um, we, on the Fort River side, and I'm hoping that I um, uploaded photos. If not, I can try to share those with you guys. Um, on the Fort River School side, um, they installed a water quality um, swale that goes to a little um, settling basin, basically right along the, the river. And um, in the course of the construction, there was a, a blowout basically, or it, prior to construction, the swale had, had caused a lot of erosion and sort of blown out an opening between the swale and the river. And um, so the contractor um, tried to rectify that and added a, um, some riprap, um, along the edge of the basin to shore it up, which I thought was fine, but it just was not part of the original plan to do that. So I wanted to make sure that you guys were um, up to speed on the change and that you actually had a chance to take a look at it. And um, apologize because now for, I thought I had uploaded it, but it's not, not getting my fingers on it right this minute. Anyways, I will keep hunting for that one. Um, and while I'm hunting for it, I'll tell you about the, the other um, change, which is basically the contractor has requested to substitute um, there. So in the Fairing Brook and the Fort River during construction, they were approved to use what's called a turbidity curtain. Turbidity curtains are, um, sort of a, a, a special kind of curtain that's hung in the, in the waterway to prevent a sediment that gets into the water from migrating um, 
downstream. And so it's supposed to sort of be a filter and the contractor does not want to, does not want to use the turbidity curtain. Instead, they would actually like to um, use stacked straw wattles in the stream. And um, again, it's, it's kind of a, a significant change in the sense that, um, I mean, it's, it's a field change and they think it'll work better because the low flows of the fairing and the Fort River make using a turbidity curtain challenging for a number of reasons. Like a turbidity curtain comes in basically like a five foot section, very long and very wide. And so the concern is using it that it's going to be kind of overwhelming for the stream being such like that the stream is maybe six inches to a foot deep, if that. Um, and so they think that by stacking straw wattle and staking them directly into the stream, that that will provide better filtration and not basically just be this big flapping piece of material in the middle of the waterway. Um, I've talked with Beth about it. And I also talked with Jonathan um, Schuster, who's the erosion control monitor and they both they both feel it's reasonable i'm i'm a little on the fence about it to be honest with you because it's um not something that i've seen in use or done before but this contractor has said that they've used it and that it's been effective so those are two minor changes that um you guys should be aware of and um let me just see if i can hopefully i can show you guys. Um, so this is where the washout area was and you can kind of see it's behind, you see where the, the black filter fabric is? Can you guys see that? Um, this is on the Fort River uh, school side and this is where the washout was. And so what they did was they laid down this filter fabric and um, these are some more photos from it. They actually did a really a really great job with it but this was an addition that wasn't part of the can't see anything Aaron okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Aaron, we're just seeing a bunch of the pictures not any yeah any. we can't see a close-up yeah. hmm. okay let me try something can you uh, explain again? um Jonathan Schuster's the erosion control um monitor but DOER is the ultimate authority on the project is that right That's a good question. So, um, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so this, there was, there was, a, let me show you first the washout. Um, let me back up for a second. Um, so this is the finished product, but right. the, this is what the original, the original area of the washout, what it kind of looked like, um, right where this erosion control fabric was, there was a break in the berm basically that, um, prevented water from flowing directly into the the river. So they um, were able to put the filter fabric down and then they added stone basically to be a solid um, uh, protection there and hopefully prevent additional erosion. Now, part of the, this, this area here was of concern because it shouldn't have extended this far into the water and so, or toward the water, toward the bank. So, um, from what I understand, Beth was going to have a portion of this stone removed um, that they just went a little overkill on how much they put in there. Um, right, so that's number one. And I think you raise a good question, um, Fletcher. Um, as far as the grant is concerned, I don't know if these changes need to be approved. Um, they've kind of, it's kind of been like, oh, we need a field change. And so let's, you know, just, a, you know, be nimble and adjust in the field. And I think sometimes you have to make those decisions. Um, I feel it's important for you guys to be in on those decisions. And so I wanted to make sure you are, but I can ask Beth about that um, and make sure that. Aaron, I can kind of jump in there. Yeah. I, I don't think and DOER is has a rep very involved in this project. So I don't I, I think we can leave that to Beth. I don't, you know, you know, I'll I'll check in with her, but I, I don't want to take your time, Aaron, chasing down every one of these things. I think we should focus on, you know, what's what's right in front of us. And you know, the communication with DOER, they're the grant funder and 
I, I, I think they will be well informed on that. So I wouldn't worry too, too much about that. We can, we can certainly follow up with Beth, but I would, you know, I would let, let's focus on what we need to do, you know, to make sure it stays in compliance, the project itself. It doesn't, it doesn't, it seems pretty good. I mean, I, I have no, um, looks like they, like with the blowout, they clearly know what they're doing. They got in there and they fixed it. I, that's great. There's obviously, this is going to be such a highly disturbed area. It's rained 95 days and two months, you know, like it's going to, uh, this, this is all there is so far. I'm actually quite surprised. And if they think a straw bales are better, try it out. You know, I mean, because the nice thing is once those things blow out, all you do is switch it out. You know, as soon as they fill up, you know, I do is switch them around. I, and I thought there was more water. I didn't know it was only just six inches to a foot on that area. Well, it's very flashy. So, right, right. Like but that's when like it's... an easy fix, right? Yeah. So if those things blow over, no problem. You just swap them out. And it sounds like somebody's there. It sounds like Beth's there every day, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, my only... I think you you raise an excellent point, and I think my only concern is monitoring. You know, like what happens on the weekend when the contractor's not there, um, and if there's a if there's a big rainstorm. I know that there there is monitoring going on from SWCA, so that's uh you know um, it's a good thing. So. Ask a question. Um, so it looks pretty denuded up to the stream. What are they, and I haven't, I'm not familiar with this project, but what are they putting in there and what are they removing? And um, just looks like a lot of disturbance right up to the river. So I was just curious about it, background. Um, Go for it, Eric. <laughs> okay. So um, the, yeah, so the town got a grant to restore um, the floodplain of the Faring Brook, this small section where the confluence comes into the Deerfield River. And in in the plan, basically it's to, you know, take down the mature vegetation. There was a quite a bit of invasives in there um, and regrade the bank, which they're sort of steep banks on either side and um, a very flashy system and also really poor water quality. The Faring Brook comes down from the center of town. Um, we have a lot of issues with um, um, bacteria in it. And so the idea is that it will add more sort of flood attenuation and improve the water quality of the Faring as it comes into the Fort River. And the, the real sort of gut check with this is um, disturbance has to happen in order to restore it. And so it's, it's one of those things that from the town standpoint, we really have to treat um, cautiously and carefully and make sure that there's no, you know, as we would any applicant, make sure that the, the impacts are, are really kept under control. Yeah, I add, there's also like really great, they're doing a bunch of habitat structure for like the mussels and stuff like that. So, and, and for the wood turtle. So there's, there's a huge cool um, habitat element going on with this project too. So um, it's very cool, but as Aaron said, we have to make a major disturbance in order to get to where you wanna go. Okay, thanks for the briefing. Anybody else have comments, questions on these changes? Actually, there, is there, um, Aaron, is that, do you have any of those uh, plans available on the SharePoint or anything that we could, or that uh, Michelle could look up? It's pretty cool. I mean, they're putting yeah. in like, some really great rock structures. Like it's a pretty in-depth, pretty fascinating, I think, project. And Yeah, I think. yeah, I think that's a great idea, Fletcher. And maybe I can, um, sh I'll share the, the plan set with Michelle so she can have a look at them and, and maybe I can talk offline with her a little bit more and just kind of go over it with her. Um, so. Do you yeah. know that Michelle have access to all the older stuff like from before when you came? Because it no, might just, be you, Aaron, to give her- Just in my tenure. Yeah, but yeah. I would appreciate that. So thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, and if good. anybody from the commission wants to make an additional visit to the site, which, you know, the next couple of weeks will be changing pretty dramatically, um, you know, we'd be happy to meet you down there. And I mean, this is a this is a project initiated by the conservation department. Um, this goes back 
probably 12 to 15 years when I first started that we identified the Fearing Brook as one of the major contributors to um, just a lot of a lot of poor water quality in the Fort River. So that's that's where this all initiated way back when. And here we are today trying the the first of what we hope will be a number of improvement projects along the uh, along the Fearing Brook. But it's it's a little jarring when you go down there to see the uh, the removal of vegetation along the along the brook. Uh, frankly, in retrospect, I wish we had done the north side because there's so much uh, Japanese knotweed on the north side. It's it would have been it would have been wonderful to try to try to remove some of that um, uh, as part of this project, but it just didn't happen that way. So. Um, so just to update you, um, as I'll, I'll try to do this pretty quickly, but um, the Podic conservation area, we have a wetland creation project there, um, you, you might recall, and this is out another one that's probably new to Michelle, um, that we're creating in the middle of the, the field at the between, it's actually at the Zala property between Podic and the Catherine Cole site, um, a um, a vernal pool and a wetland creation, uh, wetland um, replication area. And this was part of some Eversource work that was being done at the substation. And um, the hope is that um, this is the staging area for equipment. Um, and these are the access mats to get in for equipment to do the work. But we're hoping that we could create a habitat potentially for the spadefoot toads um, that are in the vicinity and um, maybe someday create, have it create basically like a um, breeding habitat where they could have some additional, additional habitat area. Um, I also, we also have large project underway, the East Leverett Road um, water main project. And today they were doing, they just started doing um, directional drilling. Um, under the Cushman Brook. And so I was out there today to take photos and um, they actually, so the, um, the drill rig is down here. It's actually pretty far away from the river right now, but they're, they're making their way closer to the river, but they actually hit bedrock. So they, right as I was there doing the inspection, they had to stop and um, get a different piece of equipment in there to do that. Um, so fairing East Leverett Road. Um, and then I um, met with Ted Parker um, uh, earlier this week on a subdivision out on South Middle Street. He's going to be coming before the board with a um, RDA for some invasive treatment at an existing subdivision site out there. Um, so that'll be coming through in the not so distant future. Erin, is that the same one we got um, complaints about? Didn't we get, we got like complaints about treatment happening of invasives back on South Middle? Um, there was a notification to us because there was some invasives treatment that was being actually being done. I believe um, it was supposed to be being done at the Amherst Hill site and the um, contractor went to the wrong location. Oh. He was supposed to be, he was supposed to look at it to basically okay. assess the, you know, kind of give him an estimate for how much it was going to be, I guess. And he got the sites mixed up and, um, but he stopped him, I guess he didn't really even, he got out there and just got situated and was about to start when they stopped him. So he didn't, he didn't actually do any application as far as I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I, I thought we had gotten a neighbor complaint about it last time. So that, yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So that's what I have for other business. Um, you know, there wasn't much in the way of like um, enfor uh, um, enforcement or certificates of compliance or emergency certs or anything like that this week, thankfully. Uh, hopefully no land use apps. No land use applications either. Right. Yeah. Um, 732, we can start our first actual hearing. Which one of these calls do I have to make? Um, oh, I've got it right here. So in the body of the email I sent you, Leroy, I kind of um, highlighted it for you to make it easy. Yes. Which I appreciate very much. <laughs> 
All right, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40, the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection Under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, SWCA for Barry Roberts slash Stanley Mitchell, Life Estate. Uh, for confirmation of the resource area boundaries, bordering vegetated wetland and bank at 246 Montague Road, map 2C, parcels 1 through 12, and 12 itself. Uh, and um, going I'm going to promote Barry. I'm guessing Tom Reedy is here for Barry, Mickey Marcus. <coughs> Um, if I missed anyone who's presenting on behalf of this project, just go ahead and raise your hand and we can promote you to panelists. And also, Leroy, I'm going to make you co-host just so that you, I should have done that at the beginning, just to make sure you have full control over muting and promoting and all that good stuff. Thank you. All right, right from the top, Nikki, Tom, and Barry, thank you for coming, but I do hear this is a big one and it looks like we have some public action on it uh so if we could keep it as brief as possible that'd be nice i understand some people went out and saw the site earlier so should be a refresher for some but it's new to me and with that i'd love to hear all about it. thank you uh, well let me just add uh, tom do you want to uh introduce the project do you want me to just go ahead and 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 do this i think you just go ahead mickey for now Okay. Hi, everybody. I met everybody before. I'm Mickey Marcus, a um, professional wetland scientist. So um, I think this project, I, I hope you, you'll agree, is, is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, it's an ANRAD. Uh, it's been in the newspapers for a research lab in the future. But uh, prior to any like design engineering, um, the idea is to uh, just make sure we've confirmed the wetlands and know what the setbacks are. So. Um, Aaron, I don't know if it makes sense to share the site plan screen, or do you want me to share that? Um, sure, I can. I can open them up for you. So we submitted um, an ANRAD for this property, and it's um, it's located uh, between Montague Road, Route sixty three, and and Sunderland Road. Uh, a lot of it's farmland. It's been farmed. It's actively farmed. Uh, and it, it has, you know, uh, Eastman Brook running uh, through the property. It has um, floodplains. It has bordering vegetated wetlands. Uh, I first started looking at this project in May, and we delayed doing the wetland delineation until the all the vegetation had grown in um, in June. So the wetland work was done in June. The, the fields had not been mown. Uh, we were able to see all the vegetation. And, and really, I think what we ended up doing was, uh, I think, Aaron, the, the plan should be at the very end of that document you're in. All right. Just want to make sure that they so see where it's generally located here. Yep. Yeah, so the, uh, that plan uh, shows uh, Route 63 on the right side of the, that figure, Sunderland Road on the left. Um, there's an existing uh, house uh, and a barn on the property. And um, yeah, that, that's probably a good good plan. So that area on the right side um, it is par all part of the floodplain of um, Fearing. Brook, I'm sorry, Eastern Brook. Um, it, 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 Basically, we try to include all the areas that, even though they were farmed wetlands, are wetlands. So um, there's floodplain, there's a floodway, which is the area right along Eastman Brook. Um, so that area on the right side is just a very large, flat floodplain that's actively farmed. Um, there's a narrow um, finger on the site that looks like it was probably once a man-made or drainage swale, but that's a very well-defined wetlands. And on the west side of the site, closer to um, Sunderland Road, th there's an area that we, we really just went back and forth trying to figure out if it's a wetland, uh, determined it was a wetland, determined it had a connection to Eastman Brook. And in fact, 
during those recent rainstorms, uh, it turned out that that wetland was accurately done. It, it had you know standing water in there and a direct connection to Eastman Brook. And Aaron, if you if you just go to the the actual site plan for the, it should be at the very one of the last pages in that submission. Um, so the Eastman Brook is, is actually very well defined. It's, it's somewhat entrenched. Um, so the banks are very clear and, and the top of the bank and the mean annual high water was really the same, um, same location. So we showed the, the riverfront and the 200 foot riverfront buffer, um, showed the wetland buffers on, on the site plan. Um, there is an existing farm road that crosses the property east to west. It, uh, it's the old farm bridge that crosses Eastman Brook. And sorry, this slow. Excuse me. Oh, I'm, I apologize. It's moving slowly. I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you. So the um, so there there is um, an old farm road, and we had um, our certified wildlife biologist Kristen McDonough go ahead and just do a wildlife habitat assessment um, of that brook and that crossing. It's not part of the ANRAD, but um, we wanted her to go look at it during the growing season. So that that's been completed. Um, so what do I say? Um, is the blue areas are the FEMA 100 year floodplain. And on the right side of the site, which is the upstream side, it's elevation 166. As you go to the left side of the site or to the west, the floodplain elevation actually increases to 172. Um, my guess is that somewhere on Sunderland, you know, with that culvert crossing, where the stream crosses Sunderland Road, I, uh, I'm guessing it's an undersized culvert and a stormwater. The hundred-year flood is backing up, and, and what we found is, you know, even the, in these recent rainstorm events, you know, we, we saw a lot of water out there. So, I think the floodplain elevations are correct. So, any future site work will need to, you know, provide, you know, any if there's any disturbance in that floodplain, then we do by elevation. But it's right now is from elevation one sixty six. To 172 and, and FEMA did do detailed cross sections through the whole site for what those elevations are. Um, during the site visit today, uh, Aaron and Larry were out there. Um, the there were a bunch of flags missing in the fields. The fields had been mown since we delineated it, the wetlands in June. Those actually got replaced this afternoon. So uh, we went back out, re-back surveyed. So if, if the commission members do go for another site visit, the wetland flags and replaced. Um, what, what I would like to do, um, you know, once you've looked at this area and have your permission, I think I, I'd like to remove those flags because they do hay it for animal use and I don't want the plastic and the flags to be used for hay. So, um, I, I think for, for the, so I'm talking about the, this Western area uh, near Sunderland Road. Thank you, Aaron. Um, that, that gets hayed and the wetlands are all remarked. You can go look at it, but um, we, we don't use wire flags for um, fields because um, if they hay that, the metal can um, affect the cows. So um, the, all the farmers say just if you use plastic in um, the fields, that's better, but, it, but I'd rather use nothing. So anyway, when, once you've completed your review, I would like to just remove all the flags that have been placed out there. So I, I think that's a summary. Um, so th there's just a lot of floodplain. There's a couple of very well-defined wetlands. I think we, you know, waiting until uh, June and waiting uh, before the, any kind of cutting to uh, do the wetland flagging, I think helped uh, determine where the wetland boundaries are. I, I know not all of you have looked at the site. Um, but happy to take any questions you have and uh, I'll keep it short at this point. All right. 
Aaron, do you have anything about this site you went on today? Yeah, so um, I guess I have a, a couple comments. Um, DEP file number comments were issued. Um, I forwarded those along to you. Um, I also have photos from the site visit. So let me get those up for you and we can maybe take a look at those. Um, so let me just get oriented here. Um, I believe this is where um, we had walked um, up from Route 63 and the um, farmhouse was kind of to the back of us and there was a barn to the left of us and this is looking down or looking um, west rather um, toward the, the wetland area. And you can see the, the, um, the larger um, um, tree uh, lined area there, that's, that's the Eastman Brook. And then there's a smaller area of vegetation in the front and that is the swale. That is that runs parallel, semi-parallel to Eastman Brook. That is just east of the um, Eastman Brook on the plans that the, that Mickey was describing. Um, this is the area um, east of the, or I'm sorry, yeah, east of the um, the farmhouse, um, looking, south southeast. Looking looking east. Looking east. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Um, and you can see they have like uh, squash planted in this area. And then there's a, um, a buffer in between. And then the wetland is below that. Um, so this is the, the smaller swale that is east of um, the brook. It runs almost parallel to the brook um, and where Jonathan is standing in the picture is um, he, this area had been hayed, um, so a portion of the the wetland flagging had been taken out. So so there were flags missing along this area, and so he was standing where the GPS unit showed the limit of BVW being, um, just to give you some visual context for the fact that um, the limit of um, the BVW had been mode and so we couldn't see where the limits of it were completely in the fields. Um, just trying to get my bearings here. I believe this is on the west side. It's between that swale area and the and the brook. Okay, yep. You're right there, Larry. Yep. That's the that's the first swale on the east side. Yep. Um, this is it's walking down the farm road um, before you come to the bridge on the left hand side. There's a um, uh, BVW that that um, is on either side of Eastman Brook there. Walking, this is the, the bridge that goes over Eastman. This is on the other side. Um, and as as we walked, you could start to see the um, indicators of the other wetland, and again, this was hayed, so we couldn't see the flagging, but we could see the wetland indicators uh, of the standing water. Um, and there was definitely hydrologic indicators there. And it was very difficult to determine the, the I mean, they, they had it on a GPS unit um, or on a, um, a tablet where the boundaries were, and we were kind of standing where the estimated area was, but it was, it was difficult to, visually assess where the limit of the boundary is. Um, so I guess as a, as a result of this, it was, it was difficult for us to visually identify where the limit of BBW were, and that's why they rehung the flags today. Um, so I had recommended that we, before proceeding, that we have those, re, those flags rehung. So it's good that they're, they have been rehung, um, and I'm not sure the extent of, if all of them have been rehung or just that portion on the west side of the brook, because there was some missing on the swale on the um, on the east side as well. Um, but DEP did provide um, some infrared imagery, which does show, um, sorry, this is 
operating. Um, infrared imagery that shows um, some additional wet soils uh, or, you know, uh, indicators of hydrology on the site. Um, and again, I think we know that those areas are floodplain. Um, it, it's, it's complex in the sense that um, these are obviously historically agricultural fields. And so the soils are disturbed um, from um, probably being, you know, plowed and turned over and also potentially from um, animals pasturing on them. And then um, in addition, because they're planted with seed we're and they're hayed, we're not necessarily going to be seeing the same wetland vegetation that we would ordinarily see on a site. Um, one question I did have, and it's, um, I'm not really sh sure if this is even worth bringing up, but, and Mickey, maybe you can um, speak to this, but on the east side of the site, um, so down in this area where my, my um, mouse cursor is, do you see this kind of channel that runs here? I wasn't sure if that was an intermittent stream that was running in the middle of the BBW. It looks, it's, it's very, it's got a very um, meandering channelized look to it um, in the aerial imagery. And so I didn't know if you guys had looked at that to see if it was um, an intermittent stream that was flowing into the Eastman Brook there. Yeah, um, so that, that area is, it, it's a, it's been farmed, it's wet, but there is a channel there and it's dominated by a, a wetland plant called Icarus or um, Sweet Flag. Uh, we, we didn't delineate that separately, Erin. Uh, it, it may be intermittent stream, I'm not sure. It could be a historic function, but it's all within BBW. Mm -hmm. hmm. And the source of that, do you know, is it, um coming from a culvert under this driveway or do you know? No, there's, there's no source of it. I, I think it's just a historic uh, stream artifact, um, okay. you know, part of the floodplain. Um, but there's, 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 it's just a ch little channel that runs through that farm field and um, it, it, it was wet, but it didn't have a source. Any old pipes coming out of the houses? <laughs> no, they, they do they do have a, um, uh, a pump that they use uh, right uh, at Route 63 for irrigation. Um, that, that was it. Yeah, it's, I saw it it's like in this area right here, I believe. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I, I saw that, you know, in Erin's slide, you know, she su suggested a third party peer review. And, you know, obviously that's, you know, the commission's decision. Um, I don't know that you need that here. I mean, all these, you should go look at it if you haven't looked at the site, but I think now that you see, now that all the wetlands have been remarked after they've been hayed, uh, we really did capture all those wet areas. And, and what the DEP was suggesting was, was is, is basically all old floodplain, but you'll see that the there's, it's not a wetland, it's a, it's a floodplain area, but, um, I think before you make that decision to you know, open it up for peer review, you should, you should go look at it. I think you'll see that we, we worked very hard to capture all the wetlands on the site. I did, uh, have, a, I did have a Oh, sorry. I appreciate you very much uh, getting out there in a timely fashion. We have definitely had some cases where it takes too long. So now that it's been reflagged, uh, hopefully we can definitely schedule some new time to get over there, but what were you going to say, Fletcher? I just did have I did have a question on, and I apologize, I didn't look at the um, the infrared stuff too uh, deeply, but um, the differences that um, DEP found with the infrared mapping to the uh, Mickey, what you guys have done, was strictly the floodplain. Um, uh, uh, I don't know alteration or floodplain. What am I trying to say here? Um, the differences that DEP found from your plan with the infrared. Yeah, we, no, we, we had looked at those. Uh, I, it, I, it's just showing uh, potential hydric soils, just saturated soils is all yeah. that is showing. So it's just sort of heads up, it's a problem area. Um, but the wetlands we delineated were actually larger than what was shown on the state 
and the town wetland maps, uh, similar, but a little larger than, than what was shown. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Let me just double check, make sure I'm spelled to everybody. All right. Then I think we should open it up. Is anything else from you, Mickey, right now? No, I, I'm good. All right, then I think we should open it up to the public. Does anybody from the public have any comments? Looking like no. Just to double check, anybody in the public who would okay. like to speak can raise their hand. Oh, I've got one. Janet, I'm gonna allow you to talk here. Should be able to speak now if you unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Janet Keller, um, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, uh, uh, actually, Dave and Chris um, met with us, some of us, but um, with Lyons, Witten, and me, and John Gerber, and described some of the process um, that. Uh, the conserv uh, Conservation Commission will be going through, but I wonder um, if you could uh, describe that briefly for others who are here this evening. It's not something that's in most people's wheelhouse. Um, you know, and even I who worked on, on some of this stuff at a, at a different level uh, than you guys do, I don't feel fully confident of it. So I would be most appreciative if you'd give us a little uh, 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 view of that. Uh, surely. Uh, it, is, it can be complex, but it shouldn't be. Uh, in this case, we are... In, in the applicant is attempting to uh, delineate, that means to identify all the resource areas we are particularly uh, looking for wetlands and surrounding. When I say BVW, that's what we mean, bordering vegetative wetlands. Um, whether or not we as a commission accept those lines or ask for a third party review is what we're discussing tonight. And that's the very basics of it, if that helps you understand it all. Uh, Ani, you want to add something? Sure. I was just going to say this is not at a point where there's a design for any sort of building or development in play. This is really just with the land as is, where are the wetlands um, boundaries? Yeah, this is specifically locating resources only. Nothing about design of future plans. Which would then come back to us. If like any future design has to come back to the, to the commission in a new process. Well, you about to say something? No, all right. Jen, does that help? That, do that does. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, that is, that is helpful. And I'm much appreciated. No problem at all. Any other comments from you or anyone else from the public? All right, looks like no final call. All right. Looks like no more comments from public. So commissioners, any more comments, thoughts, questions? I have a question for Aaron. Um, Aaron, could you reiterate why you believe it is important to have the um, have a third party review? Is it because they were moved and the flags were or the flags were up and down and up and down? Right. So I think um, agriculture can be a particularly complicated um, area to delineate for a number of reasons. Um, ordinarily, when you're delineating wetlands, you're looking at soils to identify where you have um, indicators of, of hydric soils. And so those where you have um, undisturbed soils can be easier to detect. When you have soils that have been disturbed, you might not see the same horizons in the soil that you would see in an undisturbed soil. 
Um, so that right there makes it difficult to identify a soil as hydric um, and also, you know, to, to call out the hydric indicators in the soil. And then the other thing is vegetation. Um, in an undisturbed wetland, if you, if you leave a wetland undisturbed, so for example, if they just abandoned the hay fields and they left them for like three years, you know, three to five years, you might start to see, you know, rushes and sedges and, you know, maybe other indicators start popping up. So when you went out there, you could start to see where the dominant vegetation was starting to um, establish. But in this case, where you have hay fields, um, it's very difficult to, to draw that line. And in this case, um, you know, for me personally, it's very similar to identifying bank on a river where you have a large area of disturbance. Like, so if you're looking at an entire stretch, let's say you have a huge stretch of undisturbed river, but then you have one section of disturbance in the middle of it, you wouldn't necessarily delineate that bank based upon that area of disturbance because it's not natural. You would look upstream and downstream and say, what is the, what does this area look like here? What does this area look like here to get a sense of like where the natural bank would be to approximate where the bank boundary is on the disturbed area. And in this case, when I look upstream and downstream of the Eastman Brook, I see large swaths of BVW on either side, except for this area where the hay field is. And that area is hay field with small drainage swales on either side, which indicates to me at some point those may have been BVW that drainage swales may have historically been installed to drain those areas to make them more um, uh, advantageous for, for hay fields or for agriculture. So it's very tricky. And I think, and I'm not in any way um, saying that, I think that they, they made some, they, you have to use good judgment. And I think they made some great judgment calls. And I think the, the delineation looks, looked fine to me. Um, I think that they did a great job. Obviously it's difficult to see without the flags, but I think they did a great job. I think for me, it's more of a peace of mind of checks and balances, number one. And also because it's a big site, it's an important site. And let's say the commission accepted the delineation and issued it, case closed, here you go. I think there's enough questions about the site that that could introduce the possibility of an appeal where people say, well, wait a second, we think there's wetlands here and so we want to appeal this decision and I, and I would rather that we do a thorough job on the front end to make sure that everybody is comfortable and that we've rigorously looked at the site to make sure yes we're solid on these this boundary before we issue an approval in that case we can go forward feeling very confident that hey we've had a, a second person look at this we've you know we've really thoroughly um, investigated the site and we can feel confident in the approval that we're granted and that it will stand up on appeal. And then, and I apologize if I, I missed this in my reading, when was that flagging, the current flagging done? Uh, so we started looking at the site in May okay. and delayed the delineation until all the vegetation came in in June. So the, okay. so the delineation you're seeing was done in early June. Thank and you. the data forms are in the application. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I was trying to dig through to find it, and then I realized it's faster just to ask you. Thank you. All righty. Uh, we are coming up on 8 o'clock. So if everyone has roughly an idea in mind of what they're thinking, should we move on this? <laughs> Um, I, uh, I see no reason to not go with a, a third party peer review in this case. Uh, it's just, as Aaron says, it is a very large and complicated site. Um, that said, I will say personally, I'm leaning because I've personally not seen it in person, like physically, uh, I would lean to actually continue it until I and the rest of the commission could see it. That said, has everyone else seen it? No, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Sorry, my dog has decided now is the time to play games. Uh, I, I'm inc inclined to agree with you. This is just, sorry. Um, and, and you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Mickey, in terms of it'd be great for us to get out there and look at it first. So if, if I mean, I'm, I'm kind of trying to judge your face a little bit, Mickey, to see if a continuation feels okay for you, because that's, I, I agree, Leroy. I think that's a, a good medium. And then we can decide if a third party review is the best avenue. We're not. 
I think actually Erin, when she was out there looking, the delineation is difficult now without the flags there. So, and in fact, with the, with the I was out there. I mean, I didn't do all the same thing that, that Aaron did, but but uh, it's a difficult site, and there's it's a very up and down site with very likelihood of, of wetland areas. But because it was agricultural, I think it's got to be looked at very carefully. I don't disagree. Yeah, I don't disagree about looking carefully. I just I I'm hearing the wish. Well, we would short we would shorten it if we went for third party right away. You're right. Yep. That is a good point. So if we're all comfortable going third party right away, then uh, let's move on that tonight. Keep it short. I did take the liberty of getting an estimate from um, Emily Stockman um, in advance of the meeting tonight. So I have that estimate um, if you guys want to take a look at it. Um, the benefit of that is we have the estimate, we have it approved, we can move on it and have it done concurrent to the next meeting so that we can try to, you know, have her go look at it at the same time commissioners get out there potentially um, and just make it move a little faster. Yeah, and if I can just add, so everything that all of you are saying is fine. I think Erin's description is fine. And if it gives you more comfort, you're gonna go through a third party peer review, obviously. Um, because not all of you have looked at the site, we're gonna, we would continue it anyway for at least two weeks. So you can take a look at it. And if it expedites uh, your review and your comfort level, uh, you should have uh, your third party peer reviewer look at it. And I, I know ba Barry Roberts is the applicant. Uh, he's on the line and it, it'd be helpful for me, at least if Barry can just speak up um, if that's uh, okay to continue this hearing for two weeks. Yeah, Mr. Abbas, do you have any comment on that? You're all right with the continuation? Yes, it would be fine with me to continue the hearing. It would be also fine with me to uh, engage a third party uh, and hopefully be back to the continued meeting with a report from the third party so we can keep this project moving. Excellent. Uh, Aaron, I guess we, is that two separate motions? One to continue and one to request a third party or? Do we need to continue if we're requesting the third party? Is you do You do have to have a date certain for the public hearing. Um, and so for the continuation of the public hearing, I would recommend um, that we continue the public hearing to uh, September 8th at 740. Um, and that the commission, if the commission so desires to um, move forward with the peer review process uh, so that we can try to get the review done in advance of the next meeting possible. Um, we need a motion on that. Should I move that we get yes. a third party review of the uh, site at, um, I can't remember the, it's the- 246 uh, um, Montague. 246 Montague Road. I'm looking for a second. Second. All right, voice vote. Michelle? I didn't hear, but Erin, did you hear? I, I did not. You can't hear you. It looks like I. <laughs> you did unmute. No, <laughs> I'm on mute. There, there you go. go. There, yes. there you go. Aye. Uh, 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 Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Uh, for me as well. If you don't so Aaron, thanks, all, thanks all for your time, Aaron. I think you've got the approval from the applicant to move forward with the third party peer review. So okay. if you can send that quote over, that'd be great too. But you can engage Emily to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And so um, I, I just wanted to make sure because I was taking notes while Larry was making the motion. Was the motion just for the peer review or did was there also continuation to September 8th? I, can, I did not do the continuation. 740. It was okay. just for the peer I review. did not do the continuation. Perfect, perfect. So if we could just have a second motion, that'd be wonderful. Oh, I think, does Dave have a, Dave Zomek has a uh, comment, I think. Yeah, no, I just, can everybody hear me? I just said yeah. two questions. One is um, I might've missed is does the commission, given the complexity of the site and, and the high pro profile nature of the project, is does the commission intend as a group to get out on the site in the sure, next couple of weeks? Uh, 
of in the next couple of weeks. That was my question. And my second question is just more of a comment that although we will make every effort to have the third party review done in two weeks, I just want to make sure we're realistic, you know, about that. Our intentions are that, but given that the you know the reviewer will need to walk the site, correct, review all the all the data points, et cetera. I just want to make sure we're, you know, we're just putting it out there. Our goal is two weeks, but it depends on the consultant's time and the weather and, and a number of other factors over the next two weeks. I think you're absolutely right. I think we're all on the same page there. Definitely aiming for two weeks, but it's not, we understand. Um I, sorry, Laura, can I ask you? Go ahead, Laura. Sorry, my computer just uh, freaked out and froze, so I apologize if I missed this. Um, uh, this is for Mickey and, and um, Barry Roberts. If we are not able to find a time as a full group to come visit, are we able to swing by the property and, and do a site visit on our own time? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I was going to say, you can say no. I just, I know sometimes it's tough for us to all convene. Yeah, is the, is the house occupied there? Is the residence occupied? Yes. Yeah, sort of, if you go in from the Sunderland Road side, you won't be bothering everybody because you'll be just walking up to the barn is approximately the property line, proposed okay. property line, so. Okay. Thank you. There's a very good access road from Sunderland Road right. to walk into the site. Um, all right, so I move to, can I make a motion? Are we good for that? Go for it. Right. Uh, I move we continue the hearing for the NRAD at 246 Montague Road to September 8th at 7.40 p.m. Second. Okay. Tight, tight there, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Fletcher? Aye. And Larry? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Anna? Aye. And I for me as well. Just one comment, I'll contact the Mitchells who do farm their property and let them know that multiple people may be wandering through. Thank you. So thank you, we do appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you all for your time tonight. And so thank Mickey, you. I'm sorry, uh, just thank to you. confirm again, you have the, the flags are all up now, so we should be all ready to go. They are all up, they got put up this afternoon. Okay, there's a chance I can be there first thing in the morning, so, okay. Thank you. Bye. Well. All right. Let's see who's up next. Do we we have a continuation next, right? Yes. Um so the <laughs> there was a little confusion with this filing we had a submission for um, a notice of intent at 300 North Pleasant Street and when the submission came in um I uh posted a legal ad, but the abutters weren't notified in time. So um, the applicant has requested that we have a continuation uh, to September 8th at 7.30 so that, and they have now notified abutters, but they've um, just want we just wanna make sure that all of the proper notice has been posted prior to opening that public hearing. So we would just need a motion to continue to um, the next meeting in order to review that project. I move we continue the hearing for the notice of intent at 300 North Pleasant Street to September 8th at 7.30 p.m. Second. Wow, Larry's out. <laughs> I, I gave it up. I was actually seeing if Michelle was going to jump in on this one. I, yeah. I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, voice of Michelle. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Anna. Hi. Larry? Aye. Aye for me. Great. Um, 52 Fairing. Um, so an update on 52 Fairing. Um, this is another ANRAD site that is currently under peer review. And um, Emily Stockman, the contract was finalized. And um, she is scheduled in the process of scheduling to get out there, but it's not completed yet. So. Um, on this project, we would also like to, uh, the applicant would also like to request a continuation um, until September 8th at 7.35. Was this the? Um, this is the Fearing Street this one. This is the one we, like that you the were Fearing on. The Fearing Street one, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. Got it. Got it. Yep. I have, a, I have a, a comment about this. Has, has the 
have the documents that were associated with the university pro university of mass project on it been put in our file Uh, um, the, it's, it, yes, it's, I, I know what you, I know what you're asking. So just, just to give you a little background, and I appreciate that question because I'd like to give you guys a little bit of a, an update on where things stand on on the um, watershed delineation ex as well, because there's this is kind of a two part, right? Um, so the, several documents have been provided to, I mean, many documents have been provided to me, and I am going to share all those documents with you guys. They're not uploaded on the drive yet because I'm still going through them all and incorporating them in um, some review that I am um, working on of the watershed, but basically I'm trying to incorporate multiple different watershed studies to look at the watershed as it relates to the Tanbrook to determine the watershed size. I also um, looked at the updated um, uh, digital elevation models, and I also looked at the town's stormwater data to try to get a sense of um, stormwater con con contributors to the watershed that wouldn't necessarily be picked up on a DEM. And that's important because um, this is a uh, very uh, stormwater focused water body. It runs underground basically from its source all the way to where it daylights at McClellan Street. And so there's a lot of influences and inputs to the stream that aren't just um, natural tributary contributors. They're also stormwater contributors. So I want to make sure that we're picking up those areas. So I'm, I'm trying to assemble a lot of documents and the hope is for me to have those documents assembled by the next meeting so that you guys can look at them in the drive. And also I'm hoping to meet with Emily Stockman, our peer reviewer and with Jen, so she can review the research that I've done so that we can kind of come to hopefully a consensus on what we, what we think the extent of the watershed is. So you're including that, that study that was done at UMass on the Tanbrook. There's multiple studies at UMass, but I know, I think, I think the one you're specifically referring to is the watershed evaluation that was done by the storm university water, storm itself. Water, stormwater management and, well, the stormwater management was, is one of them. I mean, that's, I've got copies of them. That's why I was wondering. Uh, yeah, anything you have that you want to share with me, Larry, I can um, in, try to include that. And you yeah, can get it right off the web. Right. So, so I'll, I'll, the, I'll some of the you. anything you want to share, I can just double check that I have access to it. But I have been sh several of the research papers that have been shared with me, and um, Mickey Marcus also shared um, some documents that were internal sort of UMass studies that were done by the university as opposed to like independent researchers who had studied Tanbrook. So all that being hey. said. Um, I am looking forward to that for one there. And I really appreciate you. It sounds like a heavy lift. Uh, I'm really looking forward to putting, seeing that all put together and going through it, so. I didn't know that was coming, but now I'm excited. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so any other comments on this or are we just moving to continue? I don't I don't have any more on it right now. Great. I I'll move we continue the public hearing for 52 Fearing Street to September 8th at 735. Second. All right, voice vote. Anna? Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Aye for me as well. All right. Town up next. So, um, I don't know what I just, what just happened there. Um, so with regard to the Robert Frost Trail project, um, the, uh, Brad presented that at the last meeting. Um, we have since received DEP final number comments. Um, thankfully, um, DEP went really easy on us, which is great because honestly, um, this, this is the, 
a very, very um, low impact and high um, mitigation potential, basically lots of improvement happening with this. Um, lots of wetland impacts are being resolved with this. Um, but I do have the DEP fine lever comments here if anybody wants to take a look at them. Um, to be honest, I feel like this is such a, a simple, basic project to replace existing footbridges and install very basic um, bog bridging to mitigate well and impacts. And so um, my recommendation to the board would be um, that we approve the order of conditions and um, just include the standard boilerplate for state and local. I agree, get it done. Get it done. I'm with you. Good project and an easy one. But any comments from commissioners? Any comments, questions from the public? Uh, one from Janet. Uh, I think you can speak now, Janet. If you like. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. So I'm just curious, you know, um, I walk that trail all the time. Um, where are you going to be working? Uh, Aaron, you have any image yeah. or math? Sure. Yeah. And this was um, presented at the, at the last meeting, but let me um, show you a couple. I'll give you just a, and, and Dave, if you would rather do this, I'm all, for however you want to do this, um, but the, this map, sorry, it's is it covering up? Um, I think. Hold on just one second. I think part of this is getting covered. I just want to make sure you guys can see site one because I can't see it on my screen. There yeah, we we're not seeing any shared screen from you. Okay. While she's, while she's pulling it up, essentially just to give you kind of the rundown in terms of language that's getting used, the bog bridging or those those little um foot bridges that span little wet areas and there's a couple i have it pulled up on my end and aaron i'll show you in a minute but where they're like completely down they're like this in the they're, they're completely tilted and in the water and stuff so it's it's a lot of um replacement work all right aaron i'm done talking sorry oh no that's fine i just feel silence as always it's never great <laughs> yeah so the, the general locations are identified here um site one down in the the south just south of um station road there's two sites um that are um west of um echo hill and then there's one site which is off of flat hills road and then um just to give you an idea of sorry that um So there's a failed footbridge that's located off Station Road. And so the idea would be to increase the span so that we're actually meeting the 1.2 times bank flow requirement for stream crossing standards through the state and um, do some restoration work on the bank to stabilize it where it's damaged. And I can show photos once um, I go through the plans here to show you. Um, sorry, this is, this is site two, which is um, behind Echo Hill. And again, there's a, an existing footbridge and the plan would be to expand the footbridge to um, widen it so that it's spanning the bank um, and stabilize the existing um, area of disturbance. Site three, um, there is currently an existing trail which has caused quite a bit of damage um, in the BVW and the, the stream. And the idea is to put a bog bridge. There's only one footing proposed um, in the BVW and then the area of disturbance would be seeded and restored. And then Flat Hills Road. Um, there's a really large area of wetland disturbance that's very, um, it's it's not vegetated and it's it looks like bikes have been going through it or other um, 
damage has been caused to the wetland. So the idea would be to concentrate foot traffic on a bog bridge. And there's three footings for the bog bridge being proposed in the wetland area, but in exchange for that, quite a bit of restoration of the stream itself and also the BBW. And then I'll just show you the photos again, uh, if I can. Bear with me just a second. For whatever reason, it's sometimes hard to navigate. Um, I don't know why photos aren't showing up here. There are, there are some there. They're in the, the ones I'm looking at are and we're in the- um... Oh, there we go. I think, okay. So there's site number one. What's wrong with this that is... one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can see it's, there's hardly any span at all. The thing is just sitting in the stream. Um... This is site two, and, and it's hard to tell here, but basically on this side, the, the bank is completely eroded, um, and it's already been reinforced by a block here, and the idea is to pick it up so it's high, higher up off the ground and span it so that it's not causing erosion on the stream bank. Um, here you can see the damage that's being caused by all the foot traffic tromping through the river, and the idea is to... Um, put a bog bridge across here to um, concentrate foot traffic and stabilize some of these areas that have been disturbed. And then the, the worst one, in my opinion, is the Flat Hills one, which you can see there's just been a lot of, um, it had just rained um, a day or two before. So it's, um, but just a lot of, a lot of foot traffic going through it and just damaging the wetland area. There's, there's a, this is actually a stream believe it or not, the stream runs um, through this area, but it's just been so heavily trafficked that it's it's kind of like turned into just a, a big pit there. So that's kind of a quick, quick review. Um, there was one, the one thing, okay, so just two quick things, I guess, um, on this. One is that natural heritage, this is not in estimated habitat. So the notice of intent is not being held up by the natural heritage review. However, it is in priority habitat. We have provided the plans to natural heritage. So until we get feedback from them um, with regard to the one site that's located in priority habitat, which is the one south of Station Road, we won't, that won't be constructed, but it's not a hindrance on us issuing the order of conditions because it's not estimated habitat. Um, there is 20 square feet of flood zone mitigation that basically because it's in the bridge itself is in flood zone and we're increasing the size of the bridge, it's 20 square feet increase in um, volume that's going to be added in the flood zone. And so it's really up to the commission with regard to if you're comfortable with just adding an increased size bridge there or if you want to have 20 square feet of restoration somewhere in the flood zone. We don't really have a site identified for that. It's all a conservation area. Um, I would personally be comfortable with just appro approving the bridge and not Increase requiring. the bridge. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a- 20 feet, 20 square feet? Yeah. What are you gonna do, two plants? Pink up for yourself, uh, saving on the foot trip, for sure. Yeah. Right. Extend the footbridge. I didn't know that about, um, you don't need it for NOIs. It doesn't have to be priority habitat. Has to, I mean, I understand. Well, you're, you're not MISA exempt. Um, you still have to file with MISA, MISA but yeah. it's not a requirement of um, a notice of intent. You don't have to actually have comments back from natural heritage in order to issue an order of conditions. The conservation commission doesn't, but, but an applicant still needs MISA approval in order to proceed. Okay. In this case, it's a it's a uh, that that first one that we looked at that's collapsed into the stream bed. So I can't imagine that they're gonna um, have a problem with us lifting that up and you know making it a, a better span of the bank. But we'll see what their feedback says. They oh, can't make a motion. Is Janet, good. Yeah. 
I think you're good, Fletcher. Go for it. Well, well, do we answer Janet's questions? Oh, she's gone. No. Yeah. I <laughs> she's gone. Yeah, anything else from the public? Hey, listening. Hi, Janet. We know you're still here. <laughs> um, so can I make a motion to um, approve the work on the Robert Frost Trail? Go for it. There, there it is. <laughs> Was that really it, Fletcher? Well, okay, I'll move. I, I, okay, I will move to approve the Robert Frost Trail with the order conditions from DEP file number 089-0690 with the boilerplate and local conditions. Second. Uh, and then, yeah. And then what we just talked about the flood, flood zone mitigation. All right, uh, voice book, Anna. Hi. Michelle. Oh, Michelle, you went the wrong way. You were unmuted and you muted. Unmuted, right? Aye. Yeah, you did. There you go. Uh, Larry? Aye. Uh, Fletcher, did I already do? No, aye. No, he did not. Aye. And aye for me. Um, do, when do you guys think you're going to get that? Are you just going to start immediately on that? I mean, that's, I did, that's a Dave Z question. We lost we're gonna all start. We're going to start tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we got to figure that out. It's a great question, Fletcher. There's there's a lot on our small uh, small staff right now with Brad and and Brendan. So yeah, we 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 wanna we wanna move on these on these bridges as soon as possible. I met with with uh, with the staff today and talked a little bit about this. So. Um, uh, as soon as we can, probably mid September would be the earliest we can get going on it. Sure. You ever do? Um, I know you probably do like volunteer trail days, but like with specifically like this type of stuff, or would you rather not have people in the way doing like construction? No, I I think it's an I think it's an untapped resource. We have not honestly. I think we have not taken full advantage of the potential for volunteers. Um, yeah. I have long advocated for kind of a volunteer coordinator for the town um, because coordinating volunteers takes mm -hmm. resources and to do it right, you really need to cultivate those volunteers. So, so it's not a one shot deal, one time event that they want to come back, they want to work with the town. And so I, I think we'll, you know, we've been talking Aaron and I, Brad and I and about how could we how could we develop a group? Uh, the, the town used to have a group called the uh, Bridge Runners and uh, years ago, and they were a group of volunteers who worked consistently with the with the department on, on uh, trail improvements, bridge improvements, things like that. So I think, you know, we've got the colleges, we've got our, our year round residents. I think a lot of people would really love to volunteer. We just need to kind of develop a program where, where we can cultivate and and encourage people to, to, to work with us, so. We talked about it at, um, as an opportunity at Sweet Alice too, mm -hmm. with trail cleanup there. Absolutely, so. Cool. <clears throat> oh, All right. Oh. Moving right along, what do we have next? Uh, poor farm? Yes. Um, so um, I don't know. I did. I did promote Dave Haynes. Dave is um, not available to join us um, over the computer tonight, but I know he has joined us from his cell phone. So um, I don't know if he is able to unmute himself to speak. Um, just click unmute. Um, but so Dave, feel free to jump in. But I did have a conversation with Dave at 530 before the meeting started tonight to, to, to talk about a few things. Um, the first and probably most important point is that so um, since our last meeting, Dave has been going back and forth with Rebecca um, from Natural Heritage Endangered Species as far as um, revising the plans to meet their satisfaction as far as the um, uh, habitat, um, the um, habitat areas on the site. And 
we did get a verbal approval from Rebecca on the plans that she was happy with them and that she would be um, issuing her official approval letter. The official approval letter has not come in, um, but she did say that the plans looked great and that she that the approval would be forthcoming um, in, a, in an email to me. So um, I just wanted to say off the bat, I don't have a problem with the commission approving um, the plan that Dave revised that she was satisfied with, so long as we have conditions in there that basically state any conditions in an approval from Natural Heritage must be um, followed by the, the order of conditions incorporated into the order of conditions in some fashion. The area um, where the work is being done in Upland is outside of Conservation Commission jurisdiction anyways. So um, it's really of little consequence to the resource areas. Um, it's basically involving planting of um, fruit and nut trees. So um, just to put that out there right off the bat that that is uh, one sort of outstanding consideration but I don't think it has to hold up us moving forward to need tonight. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk about some some of these like I would of course recommend the standard boilerplate state and local conditions right off the top as I recommend for every permit. There are a couple um, sort of case by case discussion items here, and I don't know if we want to um, discuss them um, in any particular order. Um, I'm going to sort of go from bottom to top because I think the top one is kind of the biggest discussion item. But my recommendations as far as conditions, um, in addition to the boilerplate, would be. Um, no storage of composted manure in the buffer zone, and then manure should be located in an appropriate upland location. Um, livestock fencing must be located outside of the five foot buffer established around the wetland boundary. Um, no new encroachments on the flagged wetland boundary, including livestock fencing and tree clearing. Um, there is a small chicken coop, which is shown on the plan set um, that's actually half in the wetland, half outside of the wetland, and that's a um, historic, I guess, structure on the property. And my recommendation would be, I don't have a problem with the chicken coop in the buffer zone, but that it should be moved out of the wetland. Um, there, ordinarily we would require no herbicides and pesticides on the, uh, in the buffer zone or in resource areas as a standard um, in our boilerplate. Um, my only exception on that um, from speaking with Dave earlier tonight is that they intend to do um, some invasive species management, which requires the um, application of herbicide. So um, if we include that standard boilerplate as far as no herbicides and pesticides, I'm fine with that so long as we um, have an exception for um, when they establish a um, invasive species management plan that um, they may use um, necessary um, um, applications for treatment of um, invasive species on the site. One question I had, there, there is a um, either hedgerow or split rail fencing that's shown along the trail to prevent access from the trail onto the farm. And I, I don't have a problem with either. I was just curious if that had been um, definitively identified if they were going one way or the other. Um, and let me see, I see Dave raised his hand. I'm just gonna, just my last two comments are, um, I wasn't sure if the five foot buffer that is between the wetland boundary and the um, proposed agricultural activities was to be left um, completely undisturbed or if there was going to be mowing um, on any kind of regular basis there. And then my last comment is just related to the 100 foot no disturb around the vernal pool because I believe that's the last um, real hang up in terms of just um, allowing work in that area. And I personally, because agriculture is very different from residential and commercial development, wouldn't be opposed to recommending a variance in the 100 foot vernal pool buffer. However, I do think that I would lean toward the commission um, uh, suggesting that that area be hayland as opposed to um, crop production area or, you know, 
true trees, whatever you guys think, but that maybe we restrict certain activities in that zone, if that's something you want to consider. All right. That's a lot. So I guess we'll start with the biggest one. How does anybody or anybody have any thoughts on the variance right off the top? So you're talking about the whole the the what the, they're trying to get a variance on the whole 100 foot buffer. So not um, like 100 foot 100 to the to the vernal pool as it is in the um, located in the. Um, in the field area and let me pull up a plan so that you can actually see it in context because it's only like the outer extent of the 100 foot buffer that is included. Oh. And I don't know if Dave can talk now. He might be able to can, can, can you hear me? This is Dave. Dave. Yes. Gotcha, Dave. Oh, great, thanks. I was having trouble. Um, yeah, uh, if we were asked, okay, back to, we were proposing the along the fence line there, we were proposing either or, um, and just so we had the choice, there was discussion about a split rail versus a hedgerow. We'd like to have the opportunity to do either either or. Um, and, and so that the five foot uh, strip along the edge was going to be actually mowed, uh, but not not uh, no soil disturbance would occur in there. It would be mowed. Um, the other thing, let's say that yes, uh, we would be happy to do the 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 uh, buffer to the vernal pool as a as hay only and no cropland, no no soil disturbance in there. That would be fine. And the the actually the um, the restoration plan that was submitted previously uh, for the restoration of the altered areas did include. Uh, uh, management of the invasive species, and, and in fact, using herbicides in there as as needed. Um, so it wasn't included with a notice of intent. Uh, but um, I, I think those are all the points that were that Aaron made. And I appreciate that, David. And that actually might take care of our biggest one. Sounds like everybody's on the same page about this variance. We can use this for just a. That's it, Aaron, right there, the blue. Right. So that's yeah. the section of the 100 foot. Um, Which is vernal... currently open. Currently correct? open. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And it Perfect. has been a, it has been a hay field. Yep. Uh, personally, I don't mind. I'm, I'm okay giving that variance as long as they're going to follow this restoration plan, as long as they're going to keep doing what they've been coming in front of us the last months, years, they've been talking about this project. If they're actually going to follow through with all these things, I mean, I, I do feel that they're going to. Um, I don't have an issue with it. I'm, so I might as well just get all out. Um, herbicide use, obviously, I, I do that. I think they, sh they need to if they want to tackle the invasives. They need to have that ability to do it. Um, um, what was the other things? I don't mind. I don't care about a hedgerow or a split rail fence. With the we, that's where I'll stop. I, we are. I guess we, I was just a little confused, Aaron, on the, the chicken coop one. Is it currently in place, or are they talking about reconstructing a historic structure? Yeah, let me zoom into that so you guys can have a look. Um, we're we're perfectly happy to move it out out of the wetland area. It, it may be may be reconstructed or it may not be reconstructed, but it'll definitely be moved out of the wetland area, period. Yeah, and I don't have a problem with the coop at all. I just, just like to see how it's the, yeah. um, the structure is located in the wetland just to move it out of there. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, we've, well, we've, with natural heritage, one of the things, we've come to an agreement to, to replant uh, that field over there has basically with with uh, uh, fruit and and or nut trees to to establish a grove, and natural heritage seems to be in favor of it and and happy with that. We're still not going to be mowing that area from November first to April fifteenth, or no, 
the other way around. From April 15th to November 1st, it will not be mowed. It will be mowed in the off inactive season for the species of concern, um, just to maintain it as 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 more a field and it'll prevent shrubby uh, vegetation from coming in. But it'll be a, a productive piece of the farm as 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 a uh, as a grove of, of fruit and or nuts. So to Fletcher's point earlier about the follow through, I mean, Aaron, is this something where like we can ask for check in? Like, is there some way that we can kind of confirm that, you know, that the plans are being followed as, you know, again, I think that it's not, not that we don't trust it to happen, but just to kind of add that check and balance and as we yeah. Go you guys could incorporate like a quarterly monitoring or twice yearly monitoring um, just to give us an update through the um, life of the order of conditions or something. And then to the second question, that's not, thank you. That was, that was what I was asking. Essentially was, can we do monitoring reports on, on like a much less frequent yeah. basis? Even annually, I think would be great. Yeah. 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 And, we'll yeah. Um, and then my second question was about the herbicides. Is that something that, um, Fletcher, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you that they become a necessity when you're navigating the number of invasives that are on that property. You know, I mean, I think, do we, can we pay attention to how they are applied um, in that instance as well? I can answer, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, I mean, really you're thinking with, when you're using these chemicals, it's not, it's not, you're not like hosing everything down every month. It's right. like, all right, year one, you're probably gonna hit it pretty hard and there's gonna be, some dieback, but each year, if you stay on it, it's less and less, right? To the point sometimes where you can just start pulling stuff by hand or something. Yeah. So it's not this constant, like, you know, barrage of chemical use. And, you know, when you're using these chemicals, they're like two and a half to 5% concentration. So it's like 90% water. No, I mean, I'm with you. I've, I've had so, to use my property too. I think my question was more about, is it like, a mask spraying versus a paint, like a hand application kind of situation. Oh, I would probably just be a mist blower, which is like the fine, the mist. I right. haven't been out there to see the exact stuff. It's, if it's big stem, like big um, bittersweet, you can cut it and treat it with yeah um, stuff on there. So I, f I haven't seen the um, um, the exact restoration plan with the invasives. Yeah, but the, the you had use, and the chemicals do have um, they're wetland safe. You know, I mean, whatever you want to believe it is, but yeah. what I'm saying, what I'm getting at is if you really want to get after this, after the invasive stuff and promote native bio, like native plant biodiversity, you start heavy and then it just yeah. it tails off and you got to do it, especially in those wet areas. Cause that's where it's disturbed and it's wet. So it's just constantly going to be growing right? constantly. Yeah. I mean, I just did a huge project yesterday. We're trying to save like six different types of rare plants. And I had to like hose down like four acres to like promote these plants believe me it's painful but it's no, you gotta do it once and then it just tails off every yeah, year I your insights it was, yeah thank you what i've observed out there for invasives coming in are are, are multi-floral rose bittersweet and loose strife uh the loose strife is already being pulled by hand um i don't see any reason for chemical treatment of that and what I've recommended, and I think is in the what's in the restoration plan, is to cut and and paint on the um, um, on the uh, rose and on the on the bittersweet. I I think that was what was in the restoration plan prepared by Meredith. I don't have it right in front of me, so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely very species dependent. Like I know Japanese knotweed sometimes requires foliar spray, but other yeah. species you can do stump treatments after spraying um, at the appropriate time of year. It depends on time of year, species, um, if it's after a cutting or before. Um, and the beauty of what he just talked about with the row, if you're willing to cut the rows by hand and then treat the stumps, then you, you, you're working a smaller, then you're working a much smaller area. And then once those things start to sprout, you get right back on it. Yep. And then you're using even way less. So if you can yeah. cut, if you're willing to cut and remove multi-flora rose and then treat the stumps, oh, you're like I'm familiar, Fletcher. That yeah, yeah that I don't. I don't. <laughs> all that. 
It's, it's been a rough two years, y'all. Uh, no, I mean, I, thank you for that, David. I think that's that's a really helpful, um, it's helpful to know. I think it sounds like either way it's necessary, but it's comforting to know that your plan is to do it with as little impact as possible. The other thing um, to this discussion is um, requiring um, a wetland approved herbicide if there's anything that's in or around wetlands. Um, I know like rodeo is one of the um, approved products for wetland areas yeah but with the woody stuff they're going to use um a triclopyr which would be like a garlon um yeah 3a or 4 i think uh 4 <coughs> garlon 4 it has to be a triclopyr you got to go after the woody stuff with the triclopyr and so all those are and if you're going to do cut stump you're using a little bit more concentration but you're using way, way less mm -hmm. and then hopefully you keep them knocked back and mm -hmm. That's it. So as far as the, the monitoring question, do you guys think annually would be reasonable? And I think so. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Come back to the herbicide pesticide um, question. So in total agreement about the restoration component, is it going to be specified that it's, it's specific to the restoration component and then is phased out as an allowance or is it is it an allowance in perpetuity um, or or is it assumed that they'll be using herbicides specifically to treat invasives in perpetuity i'm just you know i just am wondering if we're adding a, a blanket allowance for herbicide and pesticides or if we should be adding one that's specific to uh the restoration component and the restoration plan you know what i'm trying to get at really good question in my mind I mean, I, I would probably leave it as, from my standpoint, as open-ended in the sense that if they're willing to address invasives on the site to give them that ability to do so, um, and it would be really in conjunction with the restoration and also with the, with the order of conditions. Um, but I don't, I mean, to me, they're kind of one and the same at this point. Um, you know, the a lot of the restoration plan components are built into sort of the overall management plan for the property. And so I don't know if that yes, answers. I'm just I, wondering if, it, is it going to say you can use herbicides here? And, and so down the line, use may change, owners may change, but that specific condition is in there and can oh. be interpreted differently than are you saying just to make sure that it's noted that you can only spray for treatment of invasives versus for farm? Right. Just, just yeah. to be specific, yeah. I guess, in yeah. use that we're allowing it. And if it, it's not rolled in with pesticides, like it says herbicides yeah. and pesticides, but that we're just. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. I, I would say that um, herbicides would only be permitted for treatment of invasives if that's what they're asking for. And that's, it sounds to me like that's what they were asking for, unless I was mistaken. That, 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 that's, that's the way I've, the discussions I've had, um, it's, it is to treat the in invasives. Um, they do want to do a, a primarily an organic um, um, a farm operation here. All right, other questions by commissioners, comments? It's up on the screen, there's a lot. So take another read, double check. <laughs> yeah, do you guys want me to run through the conditions I have listed um, just so somebody, may, to make it easy for a motion or to make it easy in case you guys wanna make any mods to any of this? Um, I have monitoring on an annual basis, vernal pool buffer, Hayland only. Um, mowing is okay in the five foot buffer, um, herbicide is okay only for invasive management, uh, move the chicken coop out of BVW, no encroachment on the wetland boundary in the future, um, uh, fencing must be outside of the five foot buffer, no storage of compost or manure in the buffer must be an appropriate upland location. I think that's all that I have. Oh, the, um, Obviously, the boiler state and boil um, state and local boilerplate. If everyone's good with that, just before we move on, I 
before I ask for a motion, just a quick check for the public. Any questions, comments? Looks like no. So now we are looking for a motion. I move. I move we when. Wow. Oh, for Anna. <laughs> All right. Uh, I move we approve the order of conditions for 214 Pomeroy Lane with the noted conditions as Aaron previously stated, as well as the state and local boilerplate. Second. All right. Voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. And I for me. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank thanks. You. Thanks for your patience. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Okay, you too. All right. Is there one more? No, I think that's it. And I have already covered other business this evening. So I have one. All right. I have a bit of other business. I'm so sorry. I have my um my term as our rep to uh What's that thing that I do? CPA. Uh, CPA. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is coming up in, I can't remember the exact date, Aaron. I don't know if you have that or if I have it. Um, if I have it, I will find it. But I just FYI that that um, if we can put that on the agenda soon, if I'm super happy to keep doing it, um, it's been really, really fun. But if Fletcher really wants to fight me for it and wants it back, or if someone else is interested, we can talk about that. I don't know if we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. I just, we have a meeting tomorrow. Um, and so I looked at it, looked at the page and was like, oh, I'm up in 2021. I should pay attention to this. Um, so yeah. Is it? Sorry, CPA. Yeah. Take care of it, so, care of it now. So the, well, let me give Michelle the rundown in case she, Dave, you are still here. Maybe you know my, the answer to my question. Do you know when I'm officially booted or need to be re-upped? Um. No, I think you're the liaison from the CONCOM. So, so it's as, not an annual, so as, I don't need no, to. No, as long as you're the CONCOM, if you're, if no one wrestles this away from you or wants it, then you stay on. Fletcher was on there a couple of years. Yeah, I, I so. knew it, that I, I wasn't sure if we had to do like an actual reappointment or not. Um, but Michelle, to give you just a really quick overview, the Community Preservation Act Committee is essentially we are responsible for determining where we want the funding that hap that comes through the Community Preservation Act, which is a mix of taxpayer dollars and state and local um, matching funds as well to support community projects. Um, one of the one of the areas of which is open space, and so they have reps from the Conservation Commission. They have um, recreation, historic uh, preservation, and housing as well as the other areas. And so there's reps from those um, committees as well as some local folks, um, we're all local folks, but some some other resident appointed um, members. And so I um, took it on from Fletcher last year, is that right? Last year yeah. um, as our rep. And there, it was kind of a not an exciting year for conservation because there weren't any conservation proposals, but we get this round of proposals coming through um, in the coming months. So like in the past, Hickory Ridge was on there. Dave mentioned it before. Um, the dog park got CPA funding, like sort of Kendrick, Kendrick playground that just opened, got funding. So, um, yeah, it's a really super fun. I'm enjoying it a lot. There, there are projects that we all weigh in on and you're our liaison for the so, meeting. Yeah. When there are projects that are related to open space, I bring them back to, to y'all and kind of get opinion and feedback, um, and then take that to the committee. Yeah. There just weren't last year, any that related to conservation. Well, with that said, actually, uh, Dave, you got anything in the pipeline? Yeah. Yeah, and it, just to clarify that, the so the projects for each of the uh, uh, the four categories are typically originate in the department and the with the committee of origin. So conservation comes through staff and the commission to CPA. Historical preservation works with uh, Ben Brager, who's who's a planner who works who works with uh, Aaron and myself, uh, et cetera, over to recreation and then affordable housing also comes through the planning department. Um, right off the top of my head, I don't have any open space projects, but I will tell you that we are definitely going to keep the requests coming for um, trail and, and resource area improvements going. 
Um, we're, we're trying to spend as much as our, of our old money as possible on things like, you know, trailhead parking at uh, Sweet Alice, trail improvements, uh, bridges. Uh, you know, we, we got a lot of deferred maintenance on conservation land that needs work. So we could ask for money. It gets a little challenging because you, you technically legally can't use CPA dollars on land that was not purchased with CPA funds. So Puffer's Pond is a great example that we we might push we might push that issue a little bit in the years ahead. But uh, Puffer's Pond was not purchased with CPA dollars, so legally, technically, you can't use CPA dollars to improve it. So anyway, but it's a great committee. They're very organized, um, and they. They make decisions on on a lot of interesting projects, as Anna mentioned. And hypothetically, trail improvement mm -hmm. or work around conservation at Hickory Ridge could be could go through CPA, right? Because it was partially the CPA funds were partially used. I don't that know. Is, if still, no, um, that is true. On the land, uh, the, the that portion of Hickory Ridge right, that yeah. will be purchased with CPA dollars. I will say on that score, it's it's related, but. Staff at my urging put in a um, and my direction put in a a CDBG a community development block grant proposal for Hickory Ridge for the trails at Hickory Ridge trails to be to be made and enhanced and that was recommended uh, a week or so ago by the CDBG advisory committee to the town manager and that was somewhere in the order of one hundred and eighty thousand dollars which seems like a lot of money. But when you, if you know all the old cart paths and bridges at Hickory Ridge, um, that won't go all that far. So, um, so the good news is we might have some seed money to improve the trail system at Hickory Ridge, but um, we're going to need more there. And, and we, we've got a lot of deferred maintenance all over town, uh, bridges, trails, ADA trails. You can also request money. We could do, you could request $100,000 to improve and enhance ADA access for people with disabilities on our conservation land, you know? And we're um, really trying to get, like right now, uh, a lot of proposals come from the town, which is great. They originate from the town, which is great. But we're really also hoping that we can get more um, residents to submit proposals too. They don't need to come from a, uh, a governing body or a committee or anything like that. Um, so the uh, District One Neighborhood Association had a a proposal last year that unfortunately didn't quite qualify and I'm, I'm hoping they come back with it a little bit tweaked uh, this year, but we're, we're hoping that more residents will submit proposals too. We get things like, I mean, the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the church. Uh, there's a church that qualified under historic preservation. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really cool. It's a cool. It's a great committee. Great work. My, my comment is that there's always a learning curve in these committees. And I think that Anna should at least do two years. I'll do my best. And thank you. It's an interesting point. Uh, I really didn't know that individuals could submit proposals. So good to have it out there. Yeah, we're, we have a meeting tomorrow night where we will sh share about the process if anyone wants to come. Six o'clock. Yeah, and just to clarify, typically it's, it's a group that submits but we we can't use tax dollars to fund an individual to do X. Yeah, uh, yeah. it would be, you know, the for instance, the uh, UU congregation downtown uh, have has a very historic stained glass window. So some years ago, we funded the restoration and preservation of that stained glass window. Um, the JCA on um, Main Street on Lower Main Street. Um, uh, we funded uh, the restoration of their steeple uh, because that is actually historically a very significant congregation. I believe it was a congregational church at one time that the JCA bought and uh, they would have just soon taken down the steeple. But in fact, the steeple is a historic element of that former congregational church. So the town uh, funded the historic um, restoration of that steeple with the historic preservation comes a restriction on maintaining in that case the steeple or a stained glass window or for instance open space if we preserve open space or, or agricultural land uh, there must be an accompanying 
uh, conservation restriction or agricultural preservation restriction that goes with that with that project. And yeah. likewise, when when we do a park like Guelph Park, uh, we got I can't remember how much CPA dollars uh, we got for Groff Park. So the town must put a restriction on Groff Park so that we don't change our mind five years from now and go, we should put a wastewater treatment plant there or a fire station or something like that. So it's really yeah, cool. Keeping me out of trouble by accidentally using phrasing that I should. Yeah, it's all good. It's a, great this, it's a lot of fun. This conversation just triggered a, a conversation I had with Michelle actually. Um, and I don't know if it was acquired with CPA or had anything to do with CPA, but Michelle, you had mentioned uh, Atkins Flats parking to me, the, um, just the lack of parking there. And I didn't know, mm. I know Dave is aware of that, um, but I don't know like um, if that mm -hmm. has anything to do with CPA or um, if that's a completely separate yeah. discussion. I just figured I would earmark that one because I know it was Michelle goes there a lot and there's no parking. It's, it's a really beautiful site and there's essentially no public access to it, but it is a public. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a great one that we can dig into in the, in the, over the winter, I think realistically, <laughs> um, because there's a number of questions I have down there that predated me working for the town by many, many years. Um, so what we need to do is pull out the elements of that deal. Where did the funding come from? What were the agreements um, and all of that? Um, uh, there's also on your way down to Atkins Flats, which is off of uh, Southeast Street, on your left is a pasture that is currently um, used for horse pasturing. And I began to kind of tease out some of the history of that pasture last year. Or, excuse me, it might have been earlier this year. Um, but we need to, yeah, it's a really good point. Um, I, I know that just from my cursory look at it, there was never, there was not intent at the time of the deal to add public access or public parking per se, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, we can't do it now. So it's, it's I was a just good, wondering, yeah, yeah, the intent of the conservation of that land and if it yeah, I didn't know what it was, but it was a combination of watershed protection and water supply protection because we have one of our wells there, as you probably know, and then um, uh, we actually have two of our wells there. Um, but I think it's a great question, and I think you know it's been on my list for a while to kind of tease that out. So I think that's a good one for us this winter. Going to tease that out and see what the history is there, and see if we can achieve any access, public access, public parking. Right. Well, I don't, I don't have anything more as far as other business I was able to cover at the beginning. So um, if no one else has anything, I'm, I'm all set. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, uh, Fletcher. Hi. Larry. Hi. Michelle. Anna. Hi. Hi for me. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. Nice job, Leroy. Well done, Leroy. Good. Great job, guys. Thank as, you so much. As always, great job, Aaron. But Leroy stepped up. Nice job. Thanks, guys. You did great. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Yeah.